morning, everybody, and hello to all of you. Uh, hello, Lou. Good morning. Um, we today are we are going to talk about agoraphobia, the anxiety disease, and other psychiatric disorders. Maybe next time we'll talk about obsessive compulsive disorder. Last time, for those of you who um, listened, we were talking about opiate addiction. Right. Um, now, agoraphobia is something that most of us have met somebody or the other who has this condition. Uh, we might have a family member, a friend, and the treatment is so uh, simple and at times that I thought that I should talk about it because not everybody has this understanding, not even physicians. Mm -hmm. um, so agoraphobia is a misnomer. Uh, agoraphobia suggests that the name is a fear of open spaces. Mm -hmm. And it's actually not. It's the exact opposite. Well, it's not claustrophobia, which is a fear right. of closed spaces, but uh, it's really a fear of losing control, of not being in control. But it started at the time, from what I understand, where people in the Middle East had to come out of their homes, go across a wide open desert towards one of the oases where a ring of camels formed a market. So merchants would bring from all over the place, come to an oasis in the middle, put their tents around, a circle around the oasis, mm -hmm. and inside would come from people from all over different parts of the desert and buy whatever stuff they needed and then take their camel and ride back home. Right. People who had agoraphobia, my understanding is that they were petrified of going across the desert to that to that uh, uh, marketplace. Like animals like cover. Animals don't like being in the open either. Yeah. They see cover because right. they're vulnerable. Right, so yeah. here these people were petrified of going and people misunderstood their fear to be that of going across the open space. What they found out later was that they were not actually afraid of being in the open space as they were afraid of being inside the marketplace, which was crowded. Oh, interesting. So that when they go inside the marketplace, they get hemmed in by all sides with people and goats and children and, you know, people shouting. And if they wanted to leave to go out immediately, they say, I can't leave right now. I'm trapped here. Right. And so that fear would cause them to have a panic attack. We've seen this in today's day and age, I've seen it, with a lot of people who say, I get petrified around Christmas time. I don't like to go to the malls. I don't like the crowds. Right. So I will finish my Christmas shopping by September, and then I don't have to go into the malls. People who are, have this fear are afraid of getting going on highways. They're afraid of going through t tunnels. They're afraid of going through um, uh, barriers where they have to stand in long lines because they say, what if I needed to get out of the car and leave right now? I right. couldn't leave because I'm stuck here. Right. Um, the, these people often will go to movie theaters only if they can sit on the last aisle near the entrance at the corner seat. If they go to church, they will go way ahead of time before everybody else and sit towards the end on the aisle at the last uh, thing. Right. If they go to restaurants, they will um, either pick a table right next to the door or not go to restaurant. They'll pick up food as takeout and take it home. Mm -hmm. Many of them have said to me, well, I'm afraid that even if I get a table right next to the door, what happens if I order and the food is there, I've eaten, and I say, can I have my bill, please? And she says, it'll be here in a minute, Right. but wait till I come back. And I need to leave right then You've and there. Lost control of when you can leave, right? Yeah. So these people have often gone to supermarkets um, after uh, hours when it's like late night when there's one or two right. uh, people and not long lines because what they're afraid of is if they have a whole shopping cart and they're standing at the cashiers and they've emptied half the uh, cart and now they want to leave the cashier will say you can't leave you just emptied half this cart you got to pay for everything right empty your cart before you can leave so th what they do is they go inside they'll take like 10 pieces of uh, material put it on the counter pay for it go put it in their car come around do another 10 really and they keep going quick check out yeah, yeah. Well, yeah so the fear is oh they will not get onto planes 
Oh, commercial planes. I can imagine, yeah. Because they say once I'm in the plane, people used to misunderstand that they were fe- afraid of closed spaces, but it's actually a fear of not being in control of wanting to leave when they want to leave. So they will fly their own planes. So they're not afraid of the Interesting. F- yeah. fly, f- uh, heights, and they're not afraid of the fear of the small uh, plane, but they're afraid of not being in control. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Agoraphobia is not a fear of open spaces. It's a fear of not being in control. Um, Panic attacks often happen with a combination of three different things. And my mind is racing to say, how much can I tell the audience? There's so (laughs) much to tell. Um, What exactly causes panic attacks? And so imagine that you have a cup that when filled and it goes over the top, that filled cup produces a panic attack. What fills that cup? Three things. One is underlying genetics. So if a person has a mother and father and uncle and grandparents, all of whom have had severe panic attacks, anxiety attacks, that cup is already, let's say, half full because your genes predispose you to having panic attacks. So it's a genetic, there's a a genetic element to this as well. One of the three. Yeah, yeah. So the second component is um, stress. So if you were on a Hawaiian island and nothing to bother you, you're completely at peace, very yep. peaceful, there's no stresses, that f- there's no, and you had no genetic predisposition, your cup is empty. Right. Um, but let's say you have a, no, a lot of stress. Mm-hmm. In addition to having a lot of genetic predisposition, your cup is almost already full. Right. The third component is chemicals that you put into your system. Interesting. So caffeine, artificial colorings, artificial preservatives, MSG, frozen uh, kinds of stuff that is maintained with preservatives in there. Um, I, I'm missing a lot of stuff. I haven't done this for a few years. But there's a long list of stuff that you will predis- predispose you to having panic attacks. Not bad. Generally processed food? Generally yes, speaking? processed food for yeah, sure. Yeah. Because that's what yeah. uh, extends self, uh, shelf life. Right. Uh, just as an aside, before I forget it, many of these people, people say, when is the worst time for psychiatric patients? People think it's Christmas time. It's actually not. It's right after 4th of July. And the reason it's right after 4th of July is because everybody goes out on the 4th of July to have outdoor barbecues. Right. And they have preserved foods like hot dogs. Hot dogs are notorious for people giving people panic attacks. Really? And uh, hot dogs, uh, meats. People don't realize often that the meats in the summer are transported from the Midwest or the West across train lines where the carcasses are hung on uh, in the train, not air conditioned, but they're injected with a whole bunch of preservatives to keep them from spoiling until they come to Hunt's Market in New York City. Interesting. And so those chemicals precipitate in certain patients um, panic attacks that if the patient were to eat the same thing, which is vacuum-packed, which means that there's no chemicals, much more expensive, and I don't even know today where you get these vacuum-packed things, yep. but class uh, expensive um, supermarkets and fo- stores like that produce right. vacuum-packed meats, uh, which don't produce these. And I'll tell you a, a, an example as it comes to my mind of a patient who was married to an extremely wealthy owner of a pasta company, uh, and and what happened to her when she stopped eating meats that were uh, had chemicals in it? If you remind me, if I forget. Yeah. So where was I? We were talking about uh, what causes what causes anxiety. Yes. So the cup has to be filled with three things, genetics, stress, and chemicals. And these chemicals uh, produce uh, panic attacks. Um, I had a patient who was um, uh, an underworld, should I say, uh, king. Um, and he was a tough guy. He had an olive oil business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was that uh, uh, a program on the uh, TV? Starts with an S. Uh, 
Oh, Sopranos. Sopranos, yeah, yeah. He was just like that. Yeah. And he had anxiety attacks, and he would come to me, and uh, he would say, you know, and so anyway, cleaned his system out completely, told him what not to eat, and he was fine. And he said, I love Chinese food, but he says it has MSG. I said, you don't want to eat that. And he said, okay. So he went and ordered enough for his family, which was enough for like a whole army. And he said, I'm going to come back in a half hour, pick up the food, okay? He says, but no MSG. And the guy at the store apparently told him, yes, no MSG, no MSG. Then he came back to pick it up, had his cash in front in his hand, and he said, listen, no MSG, right? He says, no MSG. He says, okay, because if there's MSG, I will die of a heart attack. He says, and uh, somebody will come and kill you. <laughs> he said, okay. And he took all the food back, <laughs> and he said, come back in another half hour, yeah. make you new. <laughs> so... Um, and, and and this person, as long as he stay away from everything else, didn't need any medication, no panic attacks. So these three things, when the cup gets filled and overflowed, is when they have a panic attack. So we were talking before about agoraphobia, fear of going out to open spaces or doing things uh, in which the person feels out of control. At the same time, for instance, let's say I'm going to a Red Sox game or a Yankee game, and I go there, and I'm looking forward to it, but I eat a hot dog in yeah. the stand. Unbeknownst to me, the hot dog causes me to have a panic attack. I look around. A panic attack is where my I break into a sweat. My heart starts beating fast. I think I'm going to have a heart attack or go crazy. My knees turn to jelly. I can barely walk. I'm scared as heck. Yeah. And I try to get my way out, but now the crowds are preventing me from running. Yeah. And I'm, I'm more scared. These people often end up in the emergency room thinking that they're having a heart attack. And yeah. they, So then what happens is the mind says, doesn't say it's the hot dog. It says it's the stadium. Right. So I cannot go to a stadium. So they say, okay, cut that off. No more stadia for me. Right. No, I'm not going to any more stadium. Next time it happens, it happens in, say, a laundromat. So he says, I can't go to the laundromat because the laundromat caused right. my me yeah. to have it. I can't go to the supermarket. I had an anxiety attack in there. These anxiety attacks continue unrelated to where the patient is, but in his mind or her mind, generally right. more females have this than males, in her mind, it's these venues that cause these attacks. So they're misidentifying the problem. So therefore, their problems cause them to be ultimately only at home. Mm -hmm. And even at home, they have attacks. Yeah. So they will say, well, when the doorbell rings, I have an attack. When the phone rings, I have an attack or whatever. Um, and so they are feel most comfortable at home, and they feel comfortable going out if they're accompanied by a, a confidant with whom they feel comfortable. They say, I can't drive. I'm afraid of getting stuck. But if my boyfriend, my husband, whatever drives, then I feel comfortable sitting there. But even then, I have to tell him oftentimes to pull over or I'll walk out. I will not go over bridges. I will not go through tunnels, yeah. stuff like that. So you, I'm sure— I have a friend who has a br specifies bridges as the problem. There you go. Yeah. So a lot of us, everybody who's listening knows somebody or the other has some of these symptoms, mm -hmm. and they all come and do the same thing. So agoraphobia with panic attacks, agoraphobia without panic attacks attacks or panic attacks without agoraphobia. It's all kinds of combination sure. of these things and different kinds of fears. People are afraid of uh, shopping in a mall, crowded places, going on escalators, elevators, uh, airplanes, you name it. Yeah. So that's agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. I once went maybe 30, 40 years ago to a lecture by an Irishman by the name of David Sheehan. I think, Lou, you yes. had this on your... Uh, yes. on, on the, the, he wrote a book called The Anxiety Disease. The fascinating speaker, flaming red hair, <laughs> uh, very good-looking guy, spoke with an Irish brogue um, from Harvard Med School and now coined the term the anxiety disease and basically says that all of these different anxieties that occur, whether it be school phobia, phobia of going separating, separation anxiety, afraid of leaving mom and moving away, uh, going to camp, going away to college, getting married, all right. of these different anxieties all fall under the same rubric of an anxiety disease. They're all the same chemically generated 
um, uh, for fear. Events, yeah. And that these people have the same sort of thing that people that have agoraphobia and anxiety uh, attacks have, which is fear of sort of being out of control. And the same three levels of genetics, stress, and chemicals cause it to happen. Mm -hmm. In the past, and from those of you who have seen my beginnings in psychiatry going back to the mid-early 70s, I, I trained as a psychodynamic psychotherapist, I trained as a psychoanalyst, and then I got into medications. We didn't have medications back then. But at that time, people didn't use medications for this. They sat down and they talked about your background, your right. family, your mother, what caused these symptoms. Today, one prescription is all it'll take. And as David Sheehan mentions, the SSRIs, the serotonin, specific serotonin reuptake inhibitors, we started off with Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, uh, Lexapro, and so many new uh, SSRIs and SNRIs now uh, are useful in treating these uh, various uh, conditions. Um, so that, l let me pause here. Blue, any questions, anything that I can tell you that, that, that I may not have answered? So what we're working with is the principle that all anxieties and a lot of uh, psychological disorders are based in the same chemical reaction. And it's basically, I mean, if you stop and think about this, it's very intuitive, loss of control. People are very uncomfortable when they don't have control over this situation. Yes. Right? That's the basic thing. That's the basic thing, right. But we've moved away from treating that with psychotherapy, and it's more into a chemical or a drug-based response? Yeah. So uh, it, it, they've, it was narrowed down to, and its field has grown broader since then, but it started off with a feeling and understanding that this was related to a um, too heavy uptake of serotonin. So imagine that you have a tub, mm -hmm. and the tub is, we need that tub to be filled with serotonin. Right. And serotonin is something that your own body makes. You, yeah. you take in, you imbibe tryptophan, um, which is an amino acid, and the body converts it to serotonin and then pumps it out into the tub through this faucet. Okay. So as long that as... That serotonin was a good thing, though. It's serotonin kind of, It's kind of presented to us as a good thing. It is a good Calming thing. Calming agent, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is like gold to yeah. the body. Yeah, yeah. So it's very valuable. So it's pumping out serotonin into the tub, and as the tub's starting to get filled... You say, oh, wow, this is great. I feel great. No anxieties, no phobias, no fears, no obsessions, no compulsions, no panic attacks, nothing because of serotonin. Right. It's, people have said, why don't you just add it to the water supply to <laughs> really? the whole world? Yeah. Problem is that just like with a tub, you know how there's an opening at the top of the tub In to it, prevent yeah. the water from overflowing? Right. When it comes to the level where the hole is, the water starts going through the tub and to the opening, and then the level goes only up to that so hole. So the body only allows you so much serotonin. So if that hole were moved all the way to the bottom, yeah. right, to yeah. say, well, I don't want, I want to be extra careful that it doesn't go up to the top, I'm going to move this hole lower and lower and lower so that as soon as the serotonin goes up even just half an inch, it starts to go through the drain. Interesting. So the body does that? body does that uh. because it says, I don't want the serotonin to be uh, wasted. So I'm going to reuptake. It's known as a reuptake pump. So the reuptake of that serotonin through that hole is so heavily active that it actually deprives the body of serotonin. Interesting. At the m minute the receptor starts to secrete serotonin into that person's body, another reuptake pump says, whoop, whoop, too much serotonin, reuptake right. it, don't waste it, and reuptakes it so that the the other side is completely empty. So is this a genetic physical condition or is this a psychological condition? So what Sheehan says is that this is often genetic, physiological, and actually worsened as time goes on. Really? Yeah, through the generations. Yeah. So what he says is that the Irish, for instance, he's Irish, so he can talk yeah, about So am Irish. I, so I'll check him on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so he says the Irish typically had a lo lot of these anxiety disorders. And he says that what helped them, they found, whiskey. was a, what? <laughs> whiskey. Whiskey. <laughs> a stiff drink or a double of a drink. Yeah. He says when they took it, if they were panicking because they were in a crowd or whatever, they would take this and immediately the fears would go away. 
and then they could talk a mile a minute, they right. had no social phobias, they were all, and so it actually promoted because they would drink until they had their next child, and as we know, the alcoholic gene sort of passes down, and so the desire would be passed down through their genes right. to the next generation. I'm not saying this, this could be very controversial, oh, yeah. I'm just saying what David Sheehan says. We're speaking clinically. Right, yeah. clinically, so he says there are certain families, certain genetic traits, certain cultures where alcohol is used to control these anxiety disorders because they sort of run in families mm -hmm. and they use alcohol. And what happens, he says... And generally is, speaking, the Irish, for example, just an example, and again speaking clinically, their serotonin overflow support is kind of low, generally speaking. Gen for those patients among those that we're talking about. Yep. So he says that there are certain cultures, and he identifies a lot of them. It just stuck in my mind that he'd mentioned the Irish because of his flaming he red Irish. hair, and yeah. his, he was Irish. But um, So he says there are people who do this. And now you've got a double problem. You've got to control the anxiety as well as the alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you would think that, well, I've controlled the, alcohol, the, the anxiety. Now he no longer has anxiety. The alcoholism will go away, but it doesn't because the tendency for the person to reach for a glass ha is there now because of another condition that is genetic. Right. Yeah. And we talk about these disorders, whether you mentioned alcoholism or anxiety in general, we have to understand that they come in varying degrees, right? I yes. mean, we, when you say alcoholism, we all have a certain picture of what it is, but yes. there are many degrees. Many degrees. Of, of dependency right. on alcohol. And, and many of these people will only drink when they're in a situation where they're afraid. Right. They won't drink otherwise. And their anxiety comes in many levels, too. There are people who won't cross a bridge, for example, and then people who just have a low uh, chronic anxiety all the time. People are just going through their lives every day yes. with a certain level of anxiety. may not be big enough so it presents a problem that someone would point out, but they're still dealing with it. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So uh, there's a lot to talk about with all of these conditions, the agoraphobia, yeah. the anxiety disease. Um, hopefully, you've put the cover of the book on the um, Facebook page, mm -hmm. and people can look at it and see if they can read it. Um, and uh, if there's any questions, put them on the page, and I'll be happy to answer them and address them in my future um, uh, talks. I would like to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder yes. next time, and folks, these programs are basically my memoirs. Uh, I'm no longer in practice, don't have a license. This is my memories, how my life has evolved over the 50 plus years that I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. And at one point, my, I realized certain things that has actually changed my life and the life of my patients. And hopefully at some point we'll get to that too. These are your thoughts after dealing with these conditions for decades. Decades. Right? right. Uh, with an educated approach, too. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Uh, Memoirs of a Psychiatrist, that's a Facebook page. All the sessions can be found there on varying subjects. Go check it out. Memoirs of a Psychiatrist. Thank you all.